Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Beer. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Franklin Weinreb, Rudell and Vassala, where we practice entertainment law across all media, including film and television. Our guests today are Harvard Law Professor Alan Jenkins, who recently published an article entitled, 10 Things Hollywood Can Do to Fight Racism and Promote Justice, and Flo Mitchell Brown, whose career is focused on creating content for social change. As a member of the entertainment community, Franklin Weinreb recognizes the pervasive influence of Hollywood in shaping society's cultural narrative and perceptions of communities of color. In the wake of the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others, Hollywood cannot wait any longer to put the full force of its influence behind fighting systemic racism. In their conversation this afternoon, Flo and Allen will examine how Hollywood can change the presentation of black people and other people of color and stop perpetuating racial stereotypes that reinforce racial injustice and promote inequity. Alan Jenkins is a professor of practice at Harvard Law School, where he teaches courses on communications, social justice, and on race and the law. He previously co-founded and led the Opportunity Agenda, a social justice communication lab that builds support for equal opportunity through media and popular culture. He has written dozens of articles and scripts and has appeared frequently as a commentator in print and broadcast media. Alan previously served as Director of Human Rights at the Ford Foundation, Assistant to the U.S. Solicitor General, Associate Counsel to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and Law Clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry A. Blackman. Flo Mitchell Brown, who will moderate the discussion today, has spent more than 25 years in the entertainment industry. At Entertainment Partners, she served first as <laughs> VP and then as SVP of operations. And she currently is head of industry engagement for Extreme Reach, which provides payroll accounting and labor relations for productions across the entire entertainment industry. In 2018, Flo co-founded Give Film, an organization focused on creating content for change. Flo currently serves on the board of New York Women in Film and Television and is chair of the New York Production Alliance. This is a one hour webinar. And we'll dedicate the last 20 minutes to Q&A. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And now, Let's turn this discussion over to Flo and Alan. Hello, everyone. Hi, Alan. Hi, Flo, how are you doing? Good, how's it going? So far, so good. All right, great. So let's get this party started. We have a lot of um, interesting conversation that we're gonna have today and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited um, to have this opportunity here with you. And um, we'll kick this off. And, and then as Steven said, we'll get into some Q&A and have some you know, meaningful discussion around this very important conversation. So first, we, I'd love to start talking to you about this article. Um, I was quite intrigued by it myself personally. And throughout the last few weeks, I've had a lot of conversation with a lot of my colleagues in the industry and, you know, people reaching out, essentially asking, like, what can they do? And, and I also have been feeling the same way and have been giving it a lot of thought, but I, I feel like your article has provoked a lot of um, important uh, conversation around these topics. So I guess I'd like to start to find out, like, what prompted you, what inspired you to, to write this article? Mm. Well, you know, this is a moment that I think has us all 
thinking about our values, the values that we aspire to as mm -hmm. a nation, as a society, as mm -hmm. an industry, in Hollywood, as individuals, and really to focus on those values of full and equal opportunity for everyone, of systems, including our justice system, that mm -hmm. keep everyone safe, that prevent harm, that uphold the values of equal justice and accountability and fairness. And the reality that we're falling far, far, far short of those values. And mm -hmm. so that has driven folks into the street uh, demanding change. Many people in Hollywood have been among those voices, both you know influencers and celebrities, but also studios and networks calling for change. But mm -hmm. it's also a moment uh, for the industry to take responsibility for its role in what it does every day. And you know, Hollywood is an industry that has contributed to many of the negative stereotypes of African Americans and people of color that mm -hmm. exist and that influence the way in which we're treated, the way in which money flows to police departments and other places, you know, starting mm -hmm. from birth of a nation uh, through Gone with the Wind right up to today, uh, Hollywood has been uh, both part of the problem and in its activism, part of the solution. So this seemed like the right moment uh, to write something about what people can concretely do, mm -hmm. both as activists pressuring you know, outside actors and looking within at our own practices. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And, and I, I imagine your, your reason for addressing the film and television community um, would have a lot to do with your background because I know that you um, are a professor of law, you know, with race, but you also are, you know, in communications in the communications arena. But um, but what to what extent do you see the movies on television actually impacting our society? Well, we actually have a, a ton of evidence about that as well as what we all see every day. So there's a lot of research, including by my former organization, the Opportunity Agenda, but really decades of scholars and others looking at this question, showing that number one, popular media depictions of different communities and people of color in different contexts have a significant influence on how we perceive each other, how we behave. And that's not a surprise, right? The whole point of entertainment and storytelling is to influence how people think and experience the world and what emotions we have. Uh, the research also shows that those depictions have been distorted and harmful. So for example, the Opportunity Agenda's research has shown that media depictions of black men and boys are disproportionately uh, distorted in the direction of associating us with crime and violence and problems and under uh, depicting our roles as dads and workers and problem solvers. And that's far out of proportion of the reality of what the numbers would, would suggest. And the research also shows that that influence that as a whole, taken as a whole, that influences how people perceive each other. I mean, most people are fortunate enough not to have been swept into the criminal justice system almost everything they know about policing and justice is from the thousands of hours of television shows and movies that they've watched about police officers and policing and crime mm -hmm. and justice. And so when those uh, depictions are distorted and problematic and don't reveal some of the, the systemic problems mm -hmm. with our justice system, people come away with a distorted impression of each other, of our communities and of the system. Okay. Well, one of the things that I also found um, exciting about the article is that, you know, you didn't um, just address, you followed, you backed it up with some teeth and you came up with these concrete actionable items um, for consideration. And I'd love to talk to you about those right now. And, and one of them, is the, you know, I found this fascinating and it kind of lends to what you were just saying about, you know, considering a stereotype moratorium. And, you know, what do you mean by that? So the idea is what if networks, studios, individual writers' rooms and writers decided to call up a, a moratorium, a hiatus on harmful stereotypes? 
What if we went a year without a depiction of black men engaged in harmful violence uh, mm -hmm. and the violation of, of laws and people's safety? What if we went a year without depictions of women of color, uh, their characters only being hyper-sexualized or you know, sassy or uh, sarcastic all the time and, and harmful? Mm -hmm. Uh, or exotic, as we often hear about uh, South Asian and, and Asian American women and, and that stereotype. What if we went, you know, a year without a depiction of uh, Muslim or Arab or South Asian American as a threat to national security? Yeah. Uh, the idea of a, a moratorium on harmful mm -hmm. stereotypes. I, and, you know, it's provocative, it's intentionally provocative, but it's the kind of questions that we should be asking within the industry. If we're going to be protesting, as we should, mm -hmm. the uh, terrible killings of uh, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and the problems in our criminal justice system, we also have to be constantly asking uh, ourselves about our own industry. How are we behaving and what can we do to change? And so the, the moratorium on harmful stereotypes is just one proposal for a way in which we can do that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people who feel like they have content that is authentic? And it's really a depiction of the world that they know, that they came out of, and their struggle. So it's, it's, it's helping people, you know, those, may, those people also may say that it could help people understand um, part of the struggle. So what, what do you say to those people? So I would say be conscious and aware about what you're contributing and what you're contributing to. Mm -hmm. So sometimes folks are going to decide fully aware, you know what, this is a story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And, you know, perhaps it reflects some stereotypes, but it also reflects my lived reality. But know that in doing so, you're contributing to a larger system of stories, hundreds and thousands of stories that tell, bring home those negative stereotypes over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so know what you're doing. If you take responsibility for that and you decide, you know what, I know that I may be contributing, but I'm also contributing something else that's important, then, you know, have at it. But I think we need to be asking ourselves those questions. You know, I, I, I sometimes, when my kids were little, I would give them French fries, right? But if I knew they were eating French fries, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it was making them sick, I would not be giving them French fries, right? And so that's what we're being fed right now something mm -hmm. that's making us sick, that is giving us a distorted sense of reality, yeah. that's exacerbating our nation's greatest challenge, which is racism and discrimination. That's right, that's right. So while we're on this topic about stereotypes, I'd love to also just talk a little bit about the stereotype that, that there is intentionally changes made in content that gives the impression that there's always a white hero or heroine kind of weaved into the stories, even some true stories, char creating characters that didn't even exist in, in, the, in the actual story so that there is this depiction that, that we are being saved somehow. Like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, so I'll give you an extreme example and maybe a more subtle and, and familiar example and then mm -hmm. what maybe we could do about that. So years ago, I sold uh, two uh, scripts to Fox Animation. And there, one of them involved a character who was wrongly accused of uh, crime. It was a, you know, speeding. And so uh, two days later, after I made the sale, Fox, uh, Fox's Standards and Practices Office called me and they said, you need to change the accuser, the person who's making the accusation, from a police officer to a private detective. I said, well, you know, why, what's that about? They said, well, we can't depict police officers as uh, being, uh, you know, wrongly accusing someone as being part of the problem. And so this was years ago. I don't know whether that policy has changed or not, mm -hmm. but this is, it was a very specific policy which they were proactively inserting into mm -hmm. the creative process wow. to purvey the false narrative that police mm -hmm. officers can never right, can never be wrong, can never uh, wrongly accuse someone. And this was a kid's show. 
And so, you know, it was important. I think it's important for kids to know that sometimes authority figures, including police officers, will do the wrong thing. Sometimes people who are accused of something have, have not done it and are, are innocent. And so that's an extreme case in the sense that it was a specific policy. They made clear to me that my script was not going forward in the process unless I made that change. The show never ran anyway. So as it turns out, uh, it was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But you know, a, a, a less extreme version perhaps is in the, the editing process and the passes that scripts get and the notes that people get from networks and executives, which is to insert the familiar. Right. Well, we really need a, you know, a likable white character in this uh, as a protagonist or as a main character, because right. we need, uh, you know, our audience to feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. what they're really saying is, is I need to feel comfortable and I don't see myself in this story. And so part of what that means for executives in this example is to actually push yourself and sometimes trust your audience. Some of the right. data and I, you know, I've, I've cited this in the two articles that uh, uh, FWRB has, has posted on their website, uh, there's, there's good evidence to show that telling new stories with new diverse characters can be highly profitable. I mean, we only have to look at, you know, Black Panther, right? The blockbuster Marvel film that was, you know, overwhelmingly black characters to know that that can happen. But we also know from the numbers that in fact, diverse casts uh, and casts that are, are uh, le led by and often written by people of color are mm -hmm. more successful, bring in more revenue to the industry. So, you know, that means that we need to be questioning, am I really worried, if I'm giving that note, am I really worried about audience or dollars, or am I really projecting my own comfort level uh, onto someone else's work, and do I need to, to check that? Right, so I'm gonna ask you a question. Did you change it? Did you change the script? I changed the script. You did? I, I changed the script. This was uh, tw some 20 years ago. I was right. hoping you weren't going to ask me that, Flo. I, I changed the script. <laughs> and, uh, and then but you the knew thing, I was. <laughs> I, 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 I knew when I said it. And then the thing died, right? So I compromised my principle. And right. of course, I got paid. Uh, but uh, but the, the thing never made it. So, um, you know, but it left its mark on me, right? So 20 right. years later, 20 years later, I'm telling you that story about something that I wish I had not done and something I wish I had never been asked to do. Good for you. And you know what? That raises like a whole nother like conversation that it's it actually sets up for another um, conversation because you're not the only filmmaker or screenwriter who has been put in that position. And then there's so few opportunities, right? for people like us so when you get into that moment and you have an audience and they're about to do a deal with you and you can have income um you know what do you do and 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 i'd love to hear a little more from you in terms of like like what do you think about the people that are in authority that are green lighting the projects do you think that they realize and recognize? Do you, do you think they have an awareness around this, that this is a phenomena, that, that, that they are doing this like intentionally um, in terms of the stereotypes? Well, I think some do. Mm -hmm. I think some don't. In other words, they're clueless. And then I think many people feel that, many folks of power in the industry feel like, you know what, this is a compromise that I need to make. Uh, in order to move something forward or to make mm -hmm. it profitable or to sell it to the people above me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they may or may not be right. Uh, you know, the evidence suggests that they're frequently wrong. But what that really is, is a calculation, right? So rather than saying, uh, I'm not going forward with this in a form that is problematic. Mm -hmm. So let's negotiate how we can do this in a way that fits with both our values and with good storytelling and entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to capitulate, uh, you know, like I did in, in changing my storyline. Uh, and so, you know, part of what I'm suggesting is let's all be asking those questions on the, the front end. So, you know, for example, if I turn in a, a script and, you know, Mickey Mouse is featured, that's going to die immediately, right? Because it violates intellectual property. Nobody's yeah. going to let that go forward. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's an intellectual property pass that uh, always gets done. What if we were also doing 
of bigotry and stereotypes pass. And right. people think, you know what? I've looked across our networks. Well, you know, what if Fox Animation had looked across uh, its network's content and said, you know what? This is contributing to what we see becoming a problematic trend. Mm -hmm. And we're not gonna green light it. You gotta go back and tell this story in a more creative way, in a more nuanced way that doesn't uh, reinforce the same harmful problems that is in too much of our content already. Uh, right. That's the question that should be asked. Now, you know, not everyone's going to agree on mm -hmm. what is harmful uh, or what's not, or mm -hmm. whether something should go forward anyway. That's mm -hmm. good, right? That's the kind of robust debate that we should be having all the time. Right. And to your point, Flo, it shouldn't be on the least powerful person in the room, who mm -hmm. may be the only person of color or woman or queer person in the room, to always be the one having to say, you know what, this is really problematic. Because yeah, it's a lot of pressure. And, and it's not, it's just not feasible. No, it's, it's a lot of pressure, not fair. So you started to touch on bigotry pass, so let's go for it. I'd love to hear more about your idea of a bigotry pass, if you'd like to elaborate on that a little bit. Sure, well, and I, I, it's been interesting to see that this is something that folks have latched on to, including, mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood Reporter asked me to write specifically about it. Uh, this is the idea that, you know, just like we do a pass for comedy on a script or action or character development, we could be doing that same kind of pass, but for uh, stereotypes, harmful stereotypes and, and bigotry. They were at least asking those questions before anything goes out the door. Not only when there's a person of color or, mm -hmm. you know, a queer person featured, but even with an, an all white cast. Uh, or a, a show that's written for all white characters, still asking those questions about does this have to be the case and what, what might we be reinforcing by the absence of any uh, people of color or, or diversity or important themes. Uh, you know, I think, again, this then places the question in, in, as part of the institutional process rather than uh, making it the responsibility of every you know, newbie writer of color or, uh, you know, uh, or queer person or female writer uh, or what have you, writer with disabilities to always be the one who has to be uh, sounding the alarm because that gets old, right? Nobody wants to be the person who is always having to raise their hand and be the representative for their group. And over time, you, you pick up in the room, right? The eye rolling, the, all right, now Jenkins is gonna talk about race again, right? What if we were always asking that question? And maybe 90% of the time, everything's good, goes to the next phase, but maybe that 10% of the time, something gets a second look and rewritten or revisited because it's problematic. Okay, so that's, that's very fascinating. Um, and then, we talk about, you just talked about the fact that, you know, it is a lot of responsibility, right, for the same people to always have to be the ones to kind of be the squeaky wheel in these matters. And then sometimes as a result, there's some retaliation that happens. Maybe your project doesn't get um, the recognition or the support, um, even once you, you know, once it's, once it's made. Um, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on how films are made and then sometimes there's also, they're not supported. Like there's that, that's the other piece too, right? When we, once it's made, it doesn't get the same level of support that, you know, we see in our other counterparts in their films, you know? So that's, that's another piece to it. Well, sure. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm new to Hollywood relative to you, so you may, Flo, have more to say about that than I, but I, I, you know, I've worked with many, many institutions, both from the inside and the outside, and the phenomenon of, you know, when an outsider's uh, project gets the green light, goes forward, and then the, the support is not there, commensurate with past projects by their peers, and also importantly, it becomes the poster child for that group, right? So imagine if, you know, Disney had not put the full force behind Black Panther and it had not done particularly well, as some of those Marvel films have not, right? Would the story then become, well, you know, we tried that. We tried a film with a, with a, a Black character, a significant Black 
uh, cast and with a, an up and coming black director. And, you know, it just didn't work out. So lesson learned. Uh, that's something that we see play out all the time. So, you know, part of the solution there is number one, let's actually do the math, right? You know, when, when you know, uh, uh, when Black Panther is coming out, you know what you've done for the films before it. So let's make sure, as Disney appears to have done, that you put the same level of marketing and support and resources. And then let's judge it by the same standards uh, at, at the end. And if there was something different about it, let's learn, let's, the le let's have the lesson not be we tried the black thing, so we won't be doing that for another 20 years or the Asian American thing. Uh, but rather, if it didn't work as well as we expected, what should we be doing differently uh, for this next project so that it can hit its mark? Because that's what's done with the, you know, the lion's share of films made by white folks. Okay, then I also was just thinking about how if a person is like, say they're relatively new to the industry and they get to that moment of truth and they have to decide, do they make the change or not, right? Like how can a person, you know, a regular person that doesn't really have a name for themselves assume some of the responsibility, right? Because like you said, it's unfair that, you know, there's only a limited amount of people that have to like that kind of take the risk of raising their hands and, and making those stands, um, but what at, at what cost and um, how can they actually like help at you know at their level? Yeah. Well, I, right. I mean, I do think it's difficult. I think you have to have allies. I would say, and here you know, I'm I'm thinking in part of what I would have done differently. You know, if I could go back in time and and be. Uh, that new, brand new writer trying to sell my first work, I anticipate what kinds of critiques you might get and think about, you know, what is most important to me about this? What, would it, what kinds of changes would I not be willing to make? Honestly, I was, despite the fact that I'm a former civil rights lawyer, I was surprised to get that demand, right, to change that character from a private investigator, from a police officer to a private investigator. I shouldn't have been. You know, I should have thought ahead of time, what complaints might I get? I should have talked that over in advance with the person who had, had uh, commissioned the script from me and gotten his views about, you know, what might happen and what should I be thinking about and all this. These were characters of color. So, you know, it was already going to be something relatively new for uh, network animation. Uh, and then be ready, you know, to make a counter proposal uh, or to decide, you know what, I, this is this is an important principle for me. I can't, uh, I, you know, I'm going to have to walk away. And that's, you know, that's a very tough thing for for folks to do. Uh, but for all of us, there's a point at which we would walk away. And so we should be thinking ahead of time as creatives what that point is rather than have to decide in the moment what it is. Could you just speak a little bit about the person that says, well, it's just my one project. This isn't gonna like change the whole world if just my project you know, you know, just in terms of looking at um, maybe having some of this contact that that depicts, you know, African Americans and others in in a, in a negative light, and they say, well, it's just this one show. Like, what do you have? What do you say to that? You know, our shared popular culture, our our culture as people in the United States and in a global society, popular culture is a mosaic, right? It's made up of thousands of little tiles that make a larger picture. And so everything you produce as a creative, every story, every image, you know, every song is a tile in that mosaic. And so each tile matters because especially when they're lined up, you know, alongside a bunch of other tiles, the story that you're contributing to matters. So, you know, it's the same with voting. My vote might not make the difference in every election but I know that my vote contributes to our democracy in an important way, and I never miss the opportunity to vote. And similarly, every time 
we contribute a story, we should be making sure, number one, that it does no harm, right? Like, let's at least not be uh, helping the, uh, the effort to harm and uh, oppress people of color and, and people who are uh, different from the mainstream. And then number two, let's see if we can tell an affirmative story. It's not always gonna be successful, Hollywood's a tough industry, you know, no, nothing is always successful. Uh, and you know the expression, right? Nobody knows anything in Hollywood. Uh, but uh, each time it's an opportunity. And, and at a moment like this, it's a critical opportunity for us to contribute to a mosaic that is beautiful and inclusive and looks like all of us. Yeah, I love the way you put that, you know, a mosaic. Um, and I think at the end of the day, no differently than this idea of a mosaic, I think we all, have, we sh it's a shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about the big picture. And, um, and then I guess that would lead me to my, my next thought is, you know, how do we hold people accountable for the moral messaging of the story, right? Because you know, we all have our value systems that we all operate under, right? And then there's that huge overarching mosaic that blends us all together. And it's all about finding that commonality somewhere. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on that challenge? Say a little more, Flo. I'm not sure I, I'm clear on the question. So one of the, the, the statement was to be accountable for the moral message, mm -hmm. right? So... I guess, you know, how do you hold people accountable for that? The moral yeah. messaging. Got it. So, you know, this first is our own uh, accountability, right? As, as actors in, in the industry or just in, out in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, so this idea of moral, you know, almost every good story has a moral. So for people of a certain age like me, you know, think of uh, Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry films and then, um, you know, Clint Eastwood's l later films, uh, you know, Gran Torino, uh, you know, uh, Unforgiven maybe is the best example. Uh, you know, I loved all those films, but the Dirty Harry films send a message that we've given too many rights to people accused of crimes, that we need to let police officers be judge, jury, torturer, executioner. Uh, a film like Unforgiven, award-winning film, is the, the moral of that story is that violence only begets more violence and that violence corrupts the perpetrator even as it you know takes the life or at least the dignity of the victim very powerful film i loved all those films but if i'm deciding with you know if i'm sitting at a blank screen and deciding which i'm going to create i'm going to try to create one that has a moral that is aligned with my values and what I think society and our popular culture needs. In terms of outside actors, you know, we need to both call out the really, you know, damaging and, and uh, you know, problematic stereotypes, racial and, and other, um, and support groups that do. Uh, the, um, you know, the Opportunity Agenda, my former organization, Color of Change, GLAAD, uh, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, there are a number of groups that are you know, both trying to assist people in Hollywood to tell genuine stories that reflect the nuance of their respective communities and are calling out really problematic stereotypes. On top of that, we should be debating all the time, right? Not everybody's gonna get it right. Uh, you know, I was watching um, Kenya Barris's uh, Black AF with my family the other day and we were debating, like, is this problematic or not? And, you know, he took, made some interesting choices there. And I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. Right. That's the kind of debate that we should be having. And I think it's the, probably the kind of debate that he wants, that Kenya Barris wants us to be having uh, by putting something that's provocative out there. I'm not sure that I would choose to put everything on the screen that he's chosen. But I think it's within the realm that we should be debating and discussing. And that's, you know, that's how our democracy is supposed to work. And I think that's, that's something else that we should always be doing uh, with the pop culture that we're, we're ingesting. Correct. So I guess this begs another question around, you know, playing it safe. Because then if you play it safe and you don't 
and you're not as authentic, there's still that risk that then we're not promoting these conversations because there's more, that's what, like you just made a great point about, you know, your thoughts on the piece you were watching with your family is that if, if it doesn't provoke something within you, then, then maybe there, those, that, that might stall some of the authenticity and, and the creative, I guess, forces behind the piece. Um, so can you give maybe some other examples? I mean, you talked about Unforgiven, but that have influenced the real life for better. Like, do you have any idea, thoughts on that? Like any, like where people are getting it right? Sure. And, you know, I don't want to suggest that there's an, a, you know, a, a clearly right way and a clearly wrong way right. to do this. I, you know, I use the, the Black AF, the Ken, Kenya Barris example, because he's clearly thinking about it, yeah. right? He's not just putting things out there without thinking about their implications for yeah. the, the public debate and for our identity and how we're represented as Black people. And so, you know, the fact that I don't agree with all of his choices mm -hmm. is neither here nor there, right? He's putting it through his own thoughtful lens. And mm -hmm. we can, you know, debate and disagree, mm -hmm. but... Uh, he's not simply replicating stereotypes because it's lazy or because it's the safe thing to do or because, you know, someone made him do it. In fact, I think he's famously changed jobs when he was being told uh, what and, and how to, um, to do his, his art. So, you know, I, I do think that that's really what I'm recommending, not so much that there's some clear litmus test for what should and should not go forward, but mm -hmm. that we should always be asking and having a debate amongst ourselves and that the room needs to be diverse enough so that we're getting a variety of views. And by diverse, I don't mean just like one person from a group that is, is represented so that they have to then carry the whole responsibility to, to say what you know black people will think about a, a particular issue. So you know, but, but just to try to get to the second part of your question, Flo, mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's some really interesting different types of examples now, none of which would be considered playing it safe. You know, so there are things that are, are really kind of metaphoric, like, you know, Parasite uh, is a, you know, a great example mm -hmm. of a, a film, not about race, but about class dynamics and power and inequality. Uh, but it's t that part of the story is told in a, a beautiful kind of metaphoric way. Um, you know, you have, we have other things like Black Klansmen that are, you know, quite literally about race and racism and, and racial justice. So that, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of how we can tell those stories. And I think in an era in which there are, I think, 530 shows on television, uh, mm -hmm. last, last count, uh, no one should have to play it safe in order to tell genuine stories mm -hmm. and that are, uh, you know, helpful to a vibrant democracy and democratic debate and popular culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, none of us are, if we were all to take a vote, you know, on each depiction, was that helpful or harmful? You know, in, in most situations, we probably wouldn't agree. That's a good thing. Uh, my recommendation is just that we make sure we're asking the, the question and we're debating it before we're just putting stuff out in the world because we know that what has been put out to date has been extremely harmful. Okay. And that lends to the storytelling aspect of it. And so one of the assertions is that, you know, we're telling human stories in your article. You talked about telling human stories about the systematic problems, but also the solutions. So what what constitutes a human story well i you know i think in film and television almost every story is a human story it may not be focused on a, a particular individual on mm -hmm. one individual but it's going to be about people interacting with each other that's you know those are the stories that humans gravitate to whether it's you know around the campfire or uh you know TikTok or quibi or you know or film and television uh, the the point there is that we need more stories, not every story, we need more stories that provide some context so that we understand. So for example, if we're you know, in a story about uh, people of color who are living in poverty 
or uh, dealing with the criminal justice system. If you just tell that individual episodic story, like many policing uh, shows do, police procedurals do, for example, you know, most uh, Americans or many Americans are going to simply come to the conclusion that, well, it's, it's episodic. This person is responsible for where he or she finds themselves. This community is responsible. If you're not explaining any of the forces that result in, for example, communities of color being over-policed uh, or uh, jury discrimination or the, the sentencing, the way in which people of color who've, who've uh, committed the same act are disproportionately sentenced to much longer times in prison. And so then when you show up at the prison in a narrative and everyone's black and brown, uh, what conclusion would someone come to except that black and brown people are predisposed to crime and violence? Because none of that context is there. So the stories have to be human because who's gonna, who of us are gonna watch uh, a story that's just about numbers and statistics? Well, some of us would, but most people wouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. But it also, uh, in some cases, and in more cases than is currently happening, should be about the systems that get us there and some of the solutions. And let me just say something quickly about solutions flow. Uh, you know, what part of the power that artists have is mm -hmm. to depict not just the world as it is, but mm -hmm. the world as it could be. And so mm -hmm. returning to Black Panther, you can see where my uh, pop culture interests lie. Returning to, to Black Panther, think about Wakanda and the idea of an African nation untouched by colonialism, untouched by the slave trade or underdevelopment. Mm -hmm. it's it doesn't exist in the world, right? Uh, but it's inspiring. It's inspired a, you know, and contributed to an, an Afrofuturism movement around the world. Uh, it, it, because artists were able to envision something that doesn't exist, but that can, can ex inspire our imagination. And that's part of what I mean by solutions. I'm not suggesting that every filmmaker should uh, you know, know what the, the next sentencing uh, reform bill should look like, but rather to be able to tell the story of our society and world as it could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to um, just go through a couple more of these. I think we may have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down finish this conversation because we got a ton of people that want to ask questions. I see a few questions yeah. popping in. But um, one of the other items that you mentioned is imagine the world you want to see. Mm. And, and I think just by the way you speak of Black Panther and the way it made me feel hearing you speak about Black Panther, um, I think that that gives a good indication um, I think you kind of answered my question on that one already. So I'm gonna just go right down here to- oh, Flo, let me actually say another word about that because I think um, they want us to switch to Q&A in a second. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, you know, so let's take Black Panther as, you know, a, a great example. Yes. But what if, you know, I know there are a bunch of writers on this call, but what if a bunch of them were to write something, maybe science fiction or fantasy, that in which the criminal justice system in its current oppressive form no longer exists because it's been replaced by mental health services and a restorative justice mm -hmm. and uh, you know a, a drug treatment and the like. And that, okay, that sounds boring, right? That doesn't sound that entertaining, but think about what the, the writers and artists behind uh, the Black Panther and Wakanda, not just the filmmakers and screenwriters, but you know, Stan Lee and uh, Jack Kirby and, and the folks back in the day who, who invented uh, Wakanda and Black Panther. What if the, today's creative, uh, inspiring writers and creatives and voices were to take up this question of uh, a world without mass incarceration and discriminatory policing? So that's one of my charges for today uh, is the hope that uh, some folks will get to work on that. Yeah, hopefully they're listening. That's a great idea. So I think we're gonna go ahead and move to Q&A. And I think there'll be opportunities. I think we have picked up on, on, on you know, a lot of the items that we wanted to discuss regarding the article. So at this point, um, we are going to uh, turn it over for Q&A. Thank you, Flo. Uh, yeah. Great discussion. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I think we addressed a lot of good issues, but 
Q&A has, has raised some others. We talked about human stories. One question asks, it seems that more human stories about people of color would be an important advance in theatrical films. But how does that fit with Hollywood's emphasis on spectacles and tent poles? Well, you know, I, I'm gonna come back to Black Panther uh, once again. So, you know, as you all know, there was always this idea that, well, you know, black folks, uh, you know, actors, writers, directors can't hold up a tent pole film, uh, can't draw big audiences, won't be popular overseas, right? Won't draw in box office overseas. White audiences won't come to see them. Uh, it's just not true. I mean, we, we see it both in, uh, in Hollywood and in, in a, a few important examples where the investment has been made in great storytelling and, and marketing. And we see it uh, especially on television right now, which is you know, more diverse in its storytelling than it's, it's ever been. And, and it's just more content than there's ever been. So you know, it's just not the case. And it's also the case, as I mentioned, that more diverse films uh, do better at the box office. And there's a bunch of data, uh, including some that I cited in, in uh, the article that you all mentioned, that shows that actually films that are around 50% people of color uh, are doing best at the box office, or at least they did in, in 2019. Uh, so, you know, I think we just need to, if, if, um, if the industry is failing in that respect, it's a failure of creativity. Okay. So there's been some controversy around casting. When it comes to casting, should accurate race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or any of them over others be a condition to playing a role, or should the goal ultimately be that casting is completely blind to those factors for any role? Is that even a goal worth aspiring to? Well, you know, this is hotly debated. I mean, I think part of the problem, uh, Stephen, is, or part of the, the challenge in answering that, uh, that question is that you have a couple things going on, right? One is uh, you have, uh, you know, casting that's done, or, or I should say storytelling that's done in a way that uh, it was clearly had white folks in mind. Uh, and so, but it, it needs to be re-envisioned. And so we've seen, you know, a bunch of shows recently. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly Hamilton, which is about to come out in, in movie form as the, the granddaddy of those. But, you know, we, we've seen a lot, you know, the uh, Dickinson, you know, that's out now, a lot of really interesting uh, shows, the great, uh, that have more diverse casting. The, but on the flip side of that, if we know that Black folks, that Latinx uh, talent, that Asian American talent, South Asian people and the like are grossly underrepresented, uh, you know, incredibly talented people who can't find substantive roles to then create a character uh, who is that race and cast it with someone who is not that race is really problematic on, on multiple fronts, right? You, you now, uh, where you had an, uh, you know, an easy opportunity to cast someone uh, and to increase the diversity of, of leading or important characters that we see on screen, you've now squandered that uh, opportunity for, for questionable reasons. You know, the, uh, again, I'm gonna date myself, but I, you know, some folks will remember the old, the original Kung Fu television show. It's about to be rebooted. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was written with Bruce Lee in mind, and then they cast David Carradine. Uh, in that role, it re really offensive. I mean, I loved the show when I was a little kid, uh, only did I get older to really uh, find it as problematic as I now understand it to be, but it was, you know, unbelievable. And that's a pattern, that whitewashing pattern, uh, no matter how ridiculous or offensive, is something that is baked into Hollywood and entertainment going back to the minstrel shows at least. Uh, and so, you know, I think we need to be sensitive to, to both of those challenges of casting roles that are uh, you know, race neutral, probably intended to be white in a more diverse way, uh, and of both creating and casting dignified, powerful, interesting, nuanced characters of color with uh, actors and talent who are from those communities who can bring that lived experience to the role. 
Okay, so a number of questions have touched on incentive, incentives to encourage production companies, networks, and studios to discontinue stereotypes and negative reinforcements. Is that possible? Well, I think it is possible. I mean, I, I don't think it's possible, you know, in terms of the law, right? I don't, I don't think that, uh, you know, the, I, I believe strongly in the First Amendment. I don't believe government should be trying to regulate, regulate creative expression in that way. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, number one, the networks and studios and streaming services that, you know, have been tweeting Black Lives Matter and posting and all of that, they should be hard at work right now uh, adopting some policies with flexibility for creative expression uh, that will significantly incentivize uh, new storytelling, uh, eliminating problematic uh, stereotypes and uh, harmful uh, depictions, or at least patterns of harmful depictions, uh, creating diverse, uh, you know, not just writers' rooms, but executives and decision makers. Those are all things that are within the power of uh, the, the corporations that run Hollywood. And, you know, then the rest of that is up to us, right? We need to be, and I'm, by us, I mean everyday rank and file folks who need to be asking and tweeting and demanding to know uh, how are these Hollywood players responding to the moment in their own houses. Okay, this question speaks to accountability. How can studios and networks seek to make progress known on these issues so that they can agree to be held accountable as an industry going forward? Should there be some sort of rating system? And if so, what should it look like? Well, I love the idea uh, of a rating system, not in the, uh, you know, the old school uh, sense, but um, I, you know, maybe even crowdsourced of people, you know, the Rotten Tomatoes of, of uh, diversity and, and problematic stereotypes. Uh, you know, I would love to see folks start using the hashtag, uh, to, hashtag toast, T-O-S-T, -T, tired old stereotype, uh, to begin to, to police that. Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, there are also, as I said, there are organizations that are demanding those kinds of, of changes from the outside. Uh, and so people on the inside of the industry should be meeting and calling in and maybe occasionally, you know, on the down low, giving a heads up to groups who are trying to make sure that their communities are depicted uh, in a nuanced, you know, uh, full way rather than as tired old stereotypes. All right, um, here's a, a question from our audience. Can you advise aspiring writers, directors on how best to craft stories that have strong leading characters who are people of color if the writer directors themselves are not people of color? Well, so, you know, w one part of that is of course, asking yourself, am I the right person to, to tell this story? But, I, you know, the answer in many cases will be yes. And I think everyone should be thinking about stories that uh, feature, you know, people from all different communities. So, you know, one thing is do your research, right? Just if I were gonna write a film about rocket scientists, I would spend time with rocket scientists. I would ask them about what they think and what they experience. And I would talk to enough of them to get different views and perspectives because I understand that no one rocket scientist is uh, going to be representative of the experience of, of all of them. I would sit in their cafeteria, in the rocket science cafeteria at SpaceX, and listen to how they talk and what, what expressions they use and the like. I would find out where they come from. That's part of what we're supposed to be doing as storytellers. And so we need to be doing that when we're uh, you know, trying to lift up the experience of, of others, uh, of other communities that are not the same as our own. And, you know, I, I think taking the time to understand what those existing harmful stereotypes are, which is important to avoiding them, right? I, I mentioned the Opportunity Agenda, Color of Change. There are a number of organizations that have written, uh, you know, eloquently and based on research and social science about what some of the problematic stories are. Take the time to understand that 
uh, as part of your writing process. It's something that we're all expected to do as writers all the time. Uh, and so we need to make sure we're doing that when we're telling stories that involve other communities. Alan, can you touch on how Hollywood showcases Africans as uncivilized and in need of saving by nonprofits and volunteers? I remember a conversation with a friend who said that everyone in Africa lives in huts. This is a question from our audience. She didn't know there were cities there. When do we get to see African cities and confident portrayals of people of color and women in positions of power on screen? The lack of these perspectives gives more weight to people's beliefs that various minority groups are inferior in the same way that it gives weight to people's beliefs that black men, for example, are dangerous. Well, I, I certainly agree with that. I would say to the questioner, you know, from, from your lips to God's ears. I, so I don't know when we will begin to see that, but I, I think it's crucial. Um, I think that um, we, we, you know, dating back to the birth of film and the birth of a nation, uh, we have not seen uh, those nuanced depictions. And that's true both in the news media and as the questioner notes, too often in the charitable sector, uh, we see depictions of, of Africa and African people that are not sympathetic but pathetic all the time. Uh, and that repetition is really problematic. And yet again, we know from uh, you know, fantastic uh, story lines like those in uh, Black Earth Rising, which I highly recommend, uh, like Hotel Rwanda, uh, a few other examples, but also from the phenomenal, uh, you know, not only in Nigeria, but across the, the continent, Sub-Saharan Africa, they're producing remarkable uh, stories that should be part of our, our discourse uh, here in the United States and, and worldwide. Uh, and so, you know, one small thing, it's, it's not that small, I suppose, but one thing that could be done uh, for people who are in the industry who are not themselves creatives, is to look at that content. Uh, the, the American Black Film Festival, for example, uh, has always lifted up those, uh, those filmmakers uh, there. When we're not on COVID lockdown here in, in the New York area, there's a, in Brooklyn, there's a, an African film festival. Uh, so let's look at that content, at those creatives, at those writers and directors, and begin to you know, at least lift up their amazing award-winning stories that they're already telling and hopefully incorporate them and empower them and fund them as storytellers for content that we can all consume. Great. This one touches on education, Alan. I've often found in my classes dedicated to filmmaking that they were lacking in encouraging diversity. It allowed for students to fall into creating and reinforcing common tropes regarding people of color. What would you recommend universities do when educating the next content creators? Mm. Well, you know, a few things. So one is media literacy, right? Let's make sure, I'm, I'm amazed, so I teach at, at, at Harvard Law School, and at this point, when I ask my students how many of them have seen the original film, Birth of a Nation, from 19, oh, 1910, I want to say, uh, D.W. Griffith, very few of them have seen it. Uh, and so I don't want them to consume it just as entertainment, but I want them to, uh, you know, to watch it and understand it and learn about the NAACP's campaign. Uh, you know, NAACP was brand new as an organization, and one of their early campaigns was to criticize and, and uh, uh, identify as problematic the film Birth of a Nation when President Wilson was... Uh, Woodrow Wilson was showing it at the White House. It's extremely racist film that changed Americans' perception, white Americans' perceptions about what Reconstruction was and was not after the Civil War. Those are things that, you know, anyone who's going to be in the creative sphere needs to learn about, uh, not just about African Americans, but about all of the communities that make up our nation, uh, about tropes regarding immigrants and the like. Not because they can never ever produce something that you know maybe treads on a, a stereotypical depiction, but they need to know what they're doing. They need to be asking themselves. It's, it ought to be part of our technical expertise as storytellers to know not just the 
uh, mechanical history of film or you know when the first uh, you know shot of one kind or another was done but also the problematic racial stereotypes that should in my view that should be a mandatory course uh, in film schools in media studies programs uh, and probably in most other forms of higher education amen we have time for one more question what is your feeling on whether and to what extent racial diversity will improve in the film and television industry over the next five to 10 years? Hmm. Well, I, I do think it will improve. Um, and we've seen some tiny, tiny improvement. Uh, although, uh, you know, I, I, I do have to say that in Color of Change found it 65% of television shows, there were zero black writers in the writer's room in 17, uh, in only 17% of shows where there are two or more black writers. This is black folks specifically. Uh, and so we have a long, long way to go, but I think it will gradually get better. I think one of the things that gives me hope is the activism we're seeing now around multiple issues, right? People are, are demanding the removal of Confederate statues because they understand the power of culture and symbolism for perpetuating white supremacy and discrimination. And film and television have even greater power in many ways than uh, you know, a Confederate statue in a, a town square. It's also the case that we're a more diverse nation and we're getting more and more diverse. So we're almost 40% people of color, uh, millennials and, and Generation Z, people who are coming up. Not only are they a more diverse generation as consumers and as creatives, but you know, white millennials are much more likely to know and have friends who are from diverse backgrounds than their parents or their parents' parents. Uh, and knowing that, you know, knowing someone who is of a different group doesn't necessarily, you know, make you an expert on their group, but it gives you the perspective that there are different worldviews, different cultures, different experiences that are as yet untold. And so the activism plus the changing dynamics of our country, I, I think do give me some hope that five years from now, certainly 10 years from now, we're gonna have greater uh, diversity in, in Hollywood and beyond. Well, that's great to finish off on a positive note. There's a lot to, to look forward to and I really appreciate your coming today and sharing your views. Uh, I think we all benefited from them and especially uh, the conversation and questions with Flo. So we're grateful for your meaningful and informative, important conversation today. I wanna to thank the audience for participating. The questions were great. And again, I wanna thank our panelists, Flo, uh, Mitchell Brown, and Alan Jenkins. Thank you so much for your participation today. And um, so we're grateful for this and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye everyone.